So we're going to get started. A uh, little, l uh, yeah, I guess that makes sense. Let me go ahead and restart the clock here. All right. So this is ignoring the hype. Now, when I wrote this talk, wow, still a little hot, dude. So when I wrote this talk, the intent was really to try to figure out how to express appropriate architectural choices and ways to make those choices. Um, we'll get into why that is a little bit weird, but as I went through this, I opted to make some changes to the way I was thinking about architecture and decided to talk more about design principles and why those design principles actually lead to a stable deployment across multiple clouds as opposed to, hey, go do this set of code because this set of code will work. Because the reality is that that's going to change. Now, let's talk a little bit about who I am and, and why I'm giving this talk. So generally when I give talks, I talk about ghost stories. I have a background in incident response. We'll talk a little bit about who I am later. But I give really scary talks to people about things that they really, really don't ever want to have happen to them. And the concept here is really, if you architect appropriately, then you don't have to be in one of the ghost stories. But as we think about ghost stories, we all think about our fifth grade ghost, right? This is kind of what, did we all have this in like elementary school? This is kind of where we were all at? Does it give anybody else a feeling of home during this particular time of the year? So as we were, as I was going through this, it, it felt like it's Halloween, I tell ghost stories, Let's go ahead and try to make this a little bit more of a, a ghost story talk from the side, from an educational ghost story concept. Now, when we talk about ghost stories, what do you think ghost stories are for? It's kind of a long-term societal thing, right? It's an object that we've all had part parcel of as we grew up. Does anybody want to raise their hand and tell me what they think a ghost story is for? I'm going to ask you guys to do a whole bunch of stuff today. So trust me, this is the time you want to raise your hand. All right, I'm going to pose that a ghost story is there to scare you into learning a lesson, right? How do those lessons work? Well, if we think about things, last time you watched a horror movie, what did you learn? Anybody want to raise their hand and tell me what they learned from the last horror movie they watched? Oh, come on. I'm going to, scream. to scream. OK, so we watched Scream as our last horror movie. What was, one of the, what was one of the lessons we got out of that movie? Scary. Scary. Don't trust anybody. <laughs> Absolutely. Should you ever go off by yourself? Yeah. I'll be right back. No. It will end badly. One of the cool things you can do with horror movies is learn about forensics. Is that accurate? No. Blood splatter, yes. <laughs> it's just not true. Now, when we think about ghost stories, though, there is something to be said about the fact that we understand as a culture that if we watch a ghost story like Scream, and I kind of knew everybody was going to pick that, but it's kind of cool that you did, um, we're going to learn things like, I'll be right back. You don't say, I'm going to go off alone to the killer because the killer will kill you. Now, what has that hap how has that happened in history? Does anybody remember double, double, boil, and bubble? Who remembers that statement? Anybody else? Do you know where it comes from? Macbeth. So does anybody know when Macbeth actually happened? Holy crap. So ghost stories work. We're able to tell each other scary stories and hold those stories through history and learn something from those stories. So today, I'm going to use ghost stories to impart architectural wisdom. That sound about right? So I'm going to try to go ahead and pull up some scary things and put them together and then try to foreshadow what could happen to you if you don't follow them. I suppose that that kind of makes me a bit of a witch. Because in Macbeth, let's be honest, that's what the witches do. When they talk about double, double, boil, and bubble, they're talking about the foreshadowing of Macbeth's death, his father, and everything else that goes horribly awry in the poor man's life. So who am I? I'm Nate Case. Um, you can go look me up on LinkedIn. I do incident response and have done incident response for about 25 years. I've done really, really scary things and dealt with really, really scary incidents for people like AWS and all of their customers and the government and other people. Um, I've done it privately and part of a group. 
So when I talk about architecture, I have a tendency to talk about these things from that point of view. Um, when I think about the things in architecture, and since we're talking about Macbeth, why not? This particular line from Macbeth jumps out. I promise I'm not going to be your English teacher from middle school for the rest of the talk, but it was here, so I grabbed it. This particular pa passage is talking about a moment when the witches tell Macbeth something that he believes is impossible. What do hackers do? By nature, we make the impossible possible. We find the edges. We bend the things that shouldn't be bent, right? So realistically, when we talk about this particular moment, we're talking about hackers and the way that they're going to approach Macbeth later in the, in the play. Now, I think I've proven that we can go ahead and take real world stories and make them part of our learning so that we remember them for it looks like close to, what, 600 years? That's crazy. But we have to be honest. Real world events aren't cute. So when we talk about some of these things, it can get a little bit scary, and I need to make, that, make sure that we're all aware of that. Because the ghosts of reality are a little bit more ugly than the ghosts of our five-year-old grade school. So as we go forward, we're going to talk about real world ghost stories as we move. So our story opens in me writing an email. I wrote an email to Stephen Schmidt uh, early in 2019 and said, hey, look, I've been doing incident response for AWS for about a year now. And these things are the things that I think we should actually begin to tell people because if they do the first, and to be fair, my email only had nine things. Um, if they do the first nine things, about 90% of the, the issues that people see are going to go away. And that means that the incident responders from AWS won't have to do as much work. But more importantly, our customers will be happier and actually more stable. So really, we should do this. And so Steve took that email and he went on stage at reInvent and did a really cool talk. And I was just astounded that anything came from a crazy email from a guy that was doing incident response for AWS. And that turned into me writing a blog about it for AWS. And since then, this is kind of the beginning of our ghost story, right? A lot of things have happened and a lot of things have changed. So as we think about the way that these things happen and change, it's important to understand where these things come from. So when I wrote my top 10 list, what did I write it from? What, what point of view did I write it from? I wrote it from the point of view of incident response events and incident response events and incident response events. Does anybody see the problem with writing a top 10 list from a unified theory of the world when it's just incident response events? It's not a great idea, honestly. Now, I did write a really good top 10 list Right? If we look at this, you should do all of these things. And I can go through each of these things and explain to you the why. But the concept of doing a top 10 list off an incident response plan leaves us with something, uh, let's be honest, a little bit one-sided. So when I look back at the list that I wrote, and we talk about architectural plans, and the whole point of this talk being how to ignore the hype and get around marketing that will tell you how to organize things, try to remember as our first point of our little ghost story here, that the reality is that when people write these top 10 lists, we generally have a point of view. And when I wrote that top 10 list, I stand by it today. It's actually really good stuff. Um, there's one portion of it that actually says ro rotate your keys. And unfortunately, Steve took that to mean rotate your encryption keys and not your SSH keys. Different issue, but you get to the same point. So as we look at this, I want to make sure that we understand that encryption and secrets and leaks always happen together. That's my point of view as an incident responder, right? We have to be aware that not everything will affect another portion of your company the same way. So even though I'm an incident responder and I see how the whole thing's going to come apart, it doesn't necessarily mean that I understand how that's going to impact development. It doesn't mean that I understand how that's going to impact business. And so the goal for the rest of the talk today is really to unwind some of the foolishness that I wrote <laughs> when I wrote those nine things, but also deal with the fact that architectural points that we built later in, at AWS, and I'll even go into some of those papers, um, really have much larger thoughts in them and how to recognize those larger thoughts and incorporate them. So we have to also remember that little changes that we make at the beginning can make huge end changes at the end. Who's ever tried to put security on after it reaches the final gate? 
in a deployment system. Does that work ever? A little bit? Maybe? It's a mess. Now, if we think about creating best practices and we continue to hold on to our ghost story method, um, these are some of the things that I personally have read and believe in. I've actually contributed to the stuff on the left for you guys. Uh, I was part of both of those things. Uh, my name is on the docs, which is pretty cool. Uh, relatively proud of them. Why? Because it was actually a group of 20 people that sat down and figured out what the best possible solution was for everyone that was going to be using AWS. We wrote those docs. It wasn't just me with my singular point of view. It was 20 people, a guy named Sam Elmalak, that managed and maintained all of our work, and it turned out really well. That turned into what is now Architectural Cloud Foundations, or Cloud Foundations at AWS. That's a really cool way to deal with stuff. Now, I will point out to you that as we go forward, when we wrote that, we didn't write it specifically for AWS. So many of the foundational aspects of that are actually applicable for Google and Azure. Not that AWS will probably ever tell you that, but it works. Um, as we talk about Google best practices, though, it's interesting to me as we look across both of these things and begin to try to weigh them out correctly, that there's a lot of things that are actually exactly the same. Now, being a security geek and seeing things from the perspective that I see them from, I'm going to pick up on things that are obviously security related. Big surprise. Now, in your minds, does anybody actually want to raise their hand and try to respond here? Why would this be true? Why would things like that become patterns across different best practices in cloud providers? Oh, come on. Nobody's going to, okay, go ahead, great. They are indeed based on the same principles, sir. All of the Lego blocks that we build these huge things with are exactly the same. And that kind of brings us to the history lesson portion of our ghost story. So does this look familiar to anybody? We've all done these before. They were horrible. <laughs> Who's built a data center before? Was it fun? Initially. Initially. <laughs> sure. Um, how long did it take? So last time I built the data center, it took about a year and a half. So I hear you. It was a pain in the butt. It takes a long time to build one of these things. How long does it take to build a VPC in AWS? I think two minutes is long. <laughs> Looks kind of like this, though, doesn't it? Is that kind of weird? So why does this look like this? because we're humans and we like logical diagrams and blocks make sense, partly. But I think there's something more. I think the reality is that what we've been doing for the last 60 years, no joke, is really a statement of technical debt that we all just kind of live with because it's just what it is. And so as we talk about architect architecture, top 10 lists and how to figure out what the pieces parts are that we actually need to architect with, I'm going to step all the way back to 60 years ago and ask you a question, because that's what I like to do, and apparently I've got at least one guy that'll answer. Um, the reality here is, who understands exactly how a CPU works? Well, Izar, you're special. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that's part of it. We have networks, we have storage, we have CPUs, we have memory. Realistically, these are the same pieces of cloud abstraction layers that we use today, except they stretch all the way back to actual CPUs, storage, <laughs> memory, and networks that really exist that you can go touch. Yeah, I know. And they have specific properties. And because they have specific properties, there are specific bounds that we as architects need to think about as we begin to architect larger systems. And a lot of the things that I see as an architect, a developer, and an incident responder are people who have begun to build out some of these architectures without thinking about the impact of these things, okay? Now, let's say that you go grab, and I'm not going to malign any CSPs here, let's say that you go out and you grab a virtual machine from one of the CSPs, cloud service providers, that is out there in the market today. Does anybody wanna guess how much of a percentage that VPC is going to have, that virtual computer, is going to have based on just general percentages. 
how much of the network is actually going to be associated with that computer of its current backplane? 10%, 20%, 40%, 100%? What's that? So let's just say that you deploy a general virtual machine, and that has a backplane of 10 gigs. How much of that 10 gig backplane is actually provisioned for network? One hundred percent. So, like one percent. So it's not restricted. It has access to the whole thing. I would tell you, based on my experience with a large, major service pro cloud service provider, that it's closer to forty percent. Why? Because they use the other half of that forty percent for storage, because that's how the storage actually communicates to it. It's not actually on the bus and then 10% of that for management. Okay, So as we think about these things and we say, I'm going to go get a 10 gig machine, and it says up to 10 gigs on the network option there, you're not actually getting 10 gigs. You're getting f 4 gigs at best. It depends on the instance type, and it depends on exactly what you're buying. But generally speaking, across the board, it's 40%. Now. The other thing that comes up here is location. So I'm going to need three people to stand up. God forbid. One, two, three. Oh, you can stand up. It's all right. Do we have? I, I see two. We've got four. That's great. We'll use four. All right. So let's pretend that you four people are data centers for any cloud service provider in the country. It doesn't matter. How would you folks in the audience assume that the the active um, the um, Ah, the AZs are d distributed amongst these four data centers. Would you assume if we have two AZs, how are they going to be distributed? Two and two. So obviously, it's going to be these two because they're close, right? And these two because they're sort of close? That is how you would assume logically that the AZ would be defined, right? Guess what? There would be overlap, right? That makes sense. But unfortunately, the reality is regardless of the service provider you pick, Everybody in this room is going to get a different splayed out AZs pattern. None of the AZs are actually going to be the same. So even though these two guys are closer, for you, sir, it's going to be the two furthest away. And for him, it's going to be the two closest. And for him, it's going to you get the point. Why do we do that? We do that because we don't want hot spots. So the AZs are consuming Yes. And the AZs? The AZs can sit. Thank you. <laughs> Yeah. And you will have present in the whole AZ in that region. So what, what Not you true. You don't have more than five, uh, let's say, in the Oregon or... Uh, so in US East 1, the largest region that AWS has, there are five AZs. Six, like six now, now, I think, actually. Maybe six now. Yeah. How many data centers per, per AZ? What do you mean data centers? How many actual physical data centers make up an AZ? The answer is at least three. No. The answer is at least three data centers make up each AZ. Those data centers have to be less than 1.5 milliseconds separated by the speed of light. Right? Do you know how far that is? You see them as one AZ, but you can't guarantee which of those data centers you actually see as the same AZ. Your AZ is different than her AZ. Now, because of that, latency becomes a little bit fluid? So as we talk about architectural choices and we talk about the basic effects of having the same building blocks, but not necessarily understanding the building blocks that we have because we've abstracted so many layers between your ability to make a virtual machine and the actual machine that you're, virtu you're virtualized on, and then the next five machines that you virtualize with, it becomes a little bit awkward. So as we talk about 60 years of basically tech debt, what was the tech debt? It's really hard to understand. It's really hard to deal with a lot of this stuff from an actual human interaction point of view. So instead of figuring that out, we started to abstract. And we've gone through so many abstraction layers now that it becomes extremely hard as an architect 
to figure out how to do something like a database active-active cluster with a really low latency. And if that's your use case, then you have to figure out how to define which data center you're in and try to get probably two systems in the same data center or very close data centers and be able to track that latency between the data centers. But that's on you. That's got nothing to do with your cloud service provider because that's not what they do. So. It's between, uh, last time I checked, I want to say it's between the East Coast and the, like the Mississippi. So like, yeah, it's a great thought, but it doesn't really mean that they're 15 miles apart. <laughs> All right, and that's where we get back to things like this. When we used to build data centers, and I used to build data centers at geographically distributed places, we used to have to deal with how many pieces of hardware were between two points. We have to think about the latency that that caused. Now you really don't have a way to do that because there is no actual physical thing that you can go touch that is indeed descriptive of the latency it's added. The coolest thing here is that all of this is true except for accounts and subscriptions. I added subscriptions because Azure uses subscriptions, not accounts. It's still really an account, but it's a word, so whatever. They're nomenclature. This, in my opinion, is where we get our little ghosty friend. So as your incident responder, and as I look at things as we take them apart, and as I look at all of the ghost stories associated, how many times does this come up? Actually, quite a bit. See, the problem is we have logical gaps in what we assume is true versus what is actually true. And when we have top 10 lists, when we have marketing slicks that come out and talk to us about these things, we don't actually architect to what is actually in the field right now. We architect to what is actually on the slick. And the ghost stories begin to come. Why? Well, logical fallacies exist. So because the CSP says so, do you know how many times I've been involved in an incident where someone told me because somebody, somebody said so at the CSP level? The worst case of this is a company that actually used accounts for each of their devices that they put in the field. So they had a separate account for each device that they fielded. They had generated more than 20,000 devices when I was brought in to figure out what was going on with the architecture and why it wasn't working correctly. Dealing with an account structure like this is next to impossible. The response was, the CSP said so. No, 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 no. Give me your coffee for a sec. Yep. For each of your coffees, all of us have a cup of coffee, they spun up one account. And they sent those to all of the customers all over the world. Now, what does that mean? That means that we have a different key. That means we have a different user. That means we have a different root account. That means all of the things by creating a, an actual account in this particular CSP, we'd actually created the ability to have a huge attack surface. And now, because they're all linked together and we have cross-account roles, I can easily bounce between the different items in the field. So just because the CSP says so, think about the implications of what they're actually asking you to do. It says one, let's do three. This is a great one for me because people love to do VPCs and I've never understood why they like VPCs so much. Favorite point on this one was walking into account with over 2,000 VPCs. We'll get into that one in a little bit. A general principle turns into a large scale principle. What does that mean? That means it's really good to have security groups that are specific to Lambda, policy, uh, Lambda functions. So let's go ahead and have 50,000 Lambda functions and 50,000 security groups. Probably not ideal. Cloud scale. How many people here have a cloud scale company? I applaud you all because no one raised your hand. The reality of architecting at cloud scale is a very specific thing and isn't something that everybody should endeavor to do. And the number of times I've talked to people after an event has occurred because they've actually had a cloud scale deployment, scary. Encrypt everything X times. That only matters assuming you do it correctly, and it only matters assuming you can get it unencrypted. We'll talk about that in a sec. This is where the ghost comes into everything. So the problem is we all read these marketing things. We all see somebody on stage say, you should encrypt like everybody's watching. 
All of that's great, and it's important to encrypt. I don't mean to disparage encryption at all. It's a good thing. You should encrypt. But we have to make sure as we encrypt, we understand why and how we're doing it and making sure that it's not done badly. So let's go into the CSPs because the CSP says so. First thing we have to remember as architects is that CSPs make mistakes just like everybody else. God forbid, I know, but it does happen, and it's happened a number of times. Don't get sucked in because somebody said something and you do it. Don't be the company that deploys thousands of accounts. Understand that the, the suggestions that they've made have to go ahead and scale out to your business requirements. If the thing that they're suggesting, regardless of who it is, actually costs money, and your business requirements make money, then you have to make sure that actually matches. And in some cases, there are cheaper ways to do things. In many cases, SSM. Does anybody know about SSM? Simple Systems Manager? Do you know how much it costs? For most of you, it would be free. So in many cases, when someone tells you to do something else, you actually have to go ahead and think about, is there a freer, cheaper way to do this thing, right? Remember that you have a development team and an operations team, and regardless of the suggestion, if you can't figure out how to operate that thing, you probably shouldn't be fielding it. I know this sounds a little bit preachy, but this one really matters, because if you went ahead and downloaded someone's toy, and you've gone ahead and deployed it, and your operationalists don't understand how to manage that, it's not going to be something that you can deal with long term. Now, security is a thing. I have a job because I, I like security. I'm a geek. But the reality is that a lot of people will go online, figure out that the CSP has said something or that they should do something, and then they will just generally implement it without asking questions or even talking to security because obviously it's a secure thing. The CSP said to do it. That is not true. <laughs> Please don't do that. It ends badly. Now, how can it end badly? We'll get to the, there's, a, there's one in here on blueprints. I'm going to wait for this story for that one. But specifically, I'll give you some ghost stories around that. We have to remember that regardless of what we choose to do, that simplicity is the goal of what we are doing. Now, why is that true? One of the worst incidents that I've ever been a part of is an incident out of another country that dealt with communications. Communications is an interesting thing. We all like to communicate. We all want to be connected to people. In this particular situation, they wanted desperately to build out a system that would be neat and cool and mimicked signal and did all of these other cool encryption thingies with the messages and all of these things. Why did they do that? Well, they did that because they thought it was neat. They thought that if they could do it better than somebody else, that they would get money. They chose to keep the security keys on, from each device in one repo in the master system that they had more than 100 VPCs in that they had basically gone ahead and provided access to every developer in the country. So literally any developer at the company could go in, get a secret for a device, decrypt all of the messages from that device, or send that device texts based on a fictitious number, and that device would see that as a real message. So they built an anti-signal. So when we talk about things like this, we need to make sure that the choices that we make are intelligent and they actually make sense. When we talk about the CSP or the whatever says do one, don't do three, just because somebody said do one, you have to understand why they told you to do one, and doing three doesn't make it any better. Three copies of that data was not a good thing. We have to make sure that as we look at the way things are built, things are operationalized, things are developed, that it actually makes sense and we've balanced these things across the whole thing. And we have to remember that if we want to be the new signal, we shouldn't end up being the new anti-signal. Now, as we get into this one, this is where we're going to get into blueprints. Who's used a blueprint before? Blueprints are great, aren't they? I like blueprints. At one point at AWS, I actually had more than 10 blueprints to my name publicly. Do you know how many times as an incident responder I saw a blueprint in production that was specifically marked not for production? That I had written? Yeah, that's awkward. 
So one of the things that comes back to me as an incident responder, as someone who's actually done some of this work, is that just because somebody puts out a, hey, this is the POC to do this thing, totally get it, definitely do it, enjoy it, dig into it, but the reality of adding things to your network comes back to, should you be doing it? Do you understand the basics? Is it actually meeting the business need that you have? Is it just a POC? Should you actually do real architecture on top of it? Don't ever build your network based on one article that you read online. If you can't find more than two people talking about a specific network architecture, please don't do it. There's a reason for that. Um, different incident. Who's used VPC peering? Used to use. <laughs> yeah, OK. Yeah, uh, there's a reason that some people are used to use here. The reality of VPC peering is, hey, let's go ahead and create a really large, unmanaged, wide area network. What do you think happens when you make an M&A purchase and you use VPC peering to take the new M&A purchase and add it to your, v your, your company's network? Does anything, anyone have any, does everybody understand what I just said? So if I'm a VPC and I'm a specific company's network and this nice gentleman is the merger and acquisition that we've just purchased and he's got a VPC and we merge, shake my hand, what happens between the traffic now? They're connected. And if he didn't have the, let's call it money, the funds to actually do appropriate security, if he's breached, what happens to me? Yeah, that's not a good thing. You should. You should have really good security. Yeah. Do you know how many people really do? Um, this is a really important one. So let's be honest. Generally, production <laughs> blueprints are not for production. Cloud scale. Unless you are a large SaaS provider, please don't do this. This is not meant for you. It's great to read articles. It's great to have opinions. It's great to play in some of these interesting engineer games that are cloud scale types of operations. If we had to name a cloud scale company, raise your hand and name a cloud scale company that is not AWS, Azure, or Google. Netflix. Netflix. That's a good one. So who else here is about the same size as Netflix? Nice lady in the back raises her hand. <laughs> The reality here is that many of the things that we come into, because we're used to being able to purchase as much, basically, infrastructure as we want, start turning into large-scale, cloud-scale types of things, and it's a bad choice. What that ends up, as far as ghost stories go, is basically a sprawling network that no one person can manage or understand, and then you get to call me or someone like me to come in and basically unjigger it and figure out where all the pieces go and why they're there, and then actually write the security, the the security group's appropriate to how these things all are supposed to fit together. You also end up spending a whole lot more money than you need to. I mean, the architectural, cloud scale from my world means the architectural choice to make something that will have the ability to scale infinitely based on the needs of the thing that we're doing. Most people don't actually need it to scale like that because there really isn't a good reason to do it. The difference is it ends up costing a lot of money if you do it wrong. So encrypt everything X times. One of the more interesting things that I've seen in encryption, other than, hey, it's good, we like encryption, is that if I encrypt something with a bunch of things, what happens? It's more encrypted, right? Every time I add a new key in an encryption envelope to a specific target, I have another encryption key that I have to manage, maintain, and evaluate. What happens if I don't manage, maintain, and evaluate my encryption keys? Do you know how many companies that I have been an incident responder for that I can do literally zero things for because I have to go tell them, I'm sorry, all of your stuff is encrypted? So encrypting things with a bad config isn't a good idea. Please don't do it. You'll get to see me a lot more than you really want to, and, or someone like me, and you won't like the response. Talk about a ghost story. This is the end of your company like that. So good practices. 
automation, DevOps, architectural councils, and read. Why is that a good thing? Because it beats out the ghost that is the architectural boogeyman of the entire thing. So automation. This is the first time you will see your architecture fail. It will show you exactly what you should have done and why you should have done it. I would argue art automation should have been, should be part of the actual architectural process so you understand where that should actually go. You have to make sure that automation works. The worst ghost story I have about automation is a very nice man named John. John was an intern for a large military contractor. Do you know what John's first responsibility was? His first responsibility was to lower the AWS bill. Do you know how John lowered the AWS bill? He wrote an automation script to turn off machines. He found one that was really expensive, and he turned it off because nobody had logged into it. It was running at 1%. Turns out it was the SAP cluster. What happens when you turn SAP off randomly? It generally doesn't come back up. So poor John had a really bad day. Now, as we talk about things like this, we have to make sure that we need to, make, we need to get those automation processes appropriately written and run. Don't run them in production, run them in dev, understand them, but run them way back at the beginning when you're architecting. Understand how that automation process will build towards a target. Everybody loves DevOps. Um, it is not just a technical thing, as much as people want it to be. DevOps ends up in automation, sure, but when we're talking about DevOps here, I'm actually talking about the way that we interconnect our teams. So security should be part of your development team, should be part of your operations team. Security is something that isn't a definer. It shouldn't be DevSecOps. It should be DevOps done correctly, which is secure. Does everybody get that? Security is just a descriptor of the thing you're doing, not an actual thing. Avoid coffins, because we're dealing with wonderful things in Halloween and ghost stories. Yeah, no boxes that you don't see into or can get out of. So one of the things that comes up here is quite often I have people go into DevOps and they build out this really complex routine and it has a CI CD pipeline and it deploys and yada, 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 yada. But what that means is that when it comes time to actually take your deployment and move it to somewhere else, it's almost impossible. And that ends up being the coffin for that project. Now we've got to figure out how to get it into Kubernetes or get Kubernetes into Docker or take your pick of where we're going to drag this thing uh, kicking and screaming down the line. So DevOps, but make sure that you focus on good practices and not bad practices. Architectural councils, one more strut on the concept of DevOps. Um, one person plans the architecture. Who's actually had the one person do all your architectural work? One opinion is not a good idea. We have to make sure that we have multiple opinions in the system. Any technical choice, making sure the business unit is consulted. Why? Because business is important. We need to make sure that they actually do what they're supposed to do. The goal of this is actually to make one team together, as opposed to a bunch of little teams that, that are working. And never be afraid to ask for help. Um, go ahead. Uh, one person planned the, uh, planned, plans. I missed my S. Thank you, though. We should have an architectural council. One person shouldn't plan the architecture. I mistyped, sorry. Thank you for the heads up, though. Read. Um, right answers require research. I missed the F. Uh, it is one of those things that as we look at what the right answers are and we try to figure out how we're going to do right answers going forward, we need to make sure that we do the reading to understand what those right answers are. I'm gonna say this because it sucks. Being an incident responder means I get to see all of the failures that everybody has. So I can tell you right now that being a good architect is partly failing badly. Understanding how to do that in such a way that it doesn't bring the company down or break the business is really important. So when we talk about good architectural practices, we need to make sure that we read and that we understand the outcome of the things that we're going to do by reading. And it's okay to be wrong. An unprotected opinion, as I have five minutes left, is gonna go quickly. Uh, we're gonna find, say again, sorry. Uh, defending an opinion is fine, but reality, we need to make sure that as we have this opinion, we make sure that the outcome of this opinion is that it's open and 
able to be talked about, and we can lose. We can be wrong. That's okay. Closing, um, the reality here is that as we look at the ghosts of architecture, we look at the things that we shouldn't be doing, we look at the things that we should be doing, part of the reality here is that this is 60 years old. It's not easy to beat. This is the way that we've always approached computers and partners and teams and architecture. And so as we look at the little pieces that we have together, we need to figure out how to add the little pieces together to make the whole architecture that we have today. When I wrote this, it's actually pretty reasonably good. I stand by quite a bit of it, um, other than the uh, rotating your keys. But it is what it is. Uh, you should actually rotate your SSH keys, not your encryption keys all the time. That's one of those things. Uh, as we look at this, though, I stand by it. The reality is it's pretty good. And that's it.